Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to our, for our second political webinar of the year, the Hispanic Voter in 2024, The Scoop. We'll just give uh, folks that are gonna be joining just another minute before they join. We have a lot to cover today. Um, this is the first public release of this survey information. So we're super excited about sharing this with everyone. And uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes, if it, everyone could mute their, their microphones and hold questions till the end, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. We'll, uh, if you can put your question in the, the chat, that would be great. And we will address questions at the end of the webinar. So we'll just give a couple of seconds and we'll get this started. All right, let's go ahead. Next. All right, again, welcome everyone. Uh, this is, uh, we're gonna be sharing the results of a survey that was conducted by the Latino Public Opinion Forum in sponsorship from FIU, the Adam Smith Center for Economic Freedom and the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy. And of course, from us at Ads Mobili. Next. My name is Maria Lopez Twina. I'm CMO of Ads Mobile, and I'm super excited to be sharing the virtual stage again with the esteemed and illustrious Dr. Eduardo Gamarra, professor at FIU and founding director of the Latino Public Opinion Forum. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Gamarra. The next slide, just a brief message from one of our sponsors, Ads Mobile. For those of you who don't know us, we are a very trusted Hispanic first digital media company exclusively focused on the Hispanic market and super serving the multi-generational Hispanic cohort across screens and platforms with everything from precise targeting to custom opportunities. Next. We started over a dozen years ago and we actually pioneered Hispanic mobile advertising. And as our consumer cohort evolved, so did we. We're minority owned and certified. We reach 65% of the total digital Hispanic population. We have special relationships with 25, more than 2,500 Hispanic digital publishers and our data strategy leverages key second and third party data providers to hyper target our consumers. We are, a, we have a very extensive solution suite from social influencers and sponsorships to our CTV offering Nuestra.tv to our digital out of home solutions that engage consumers at organic touch points. And of course our commitment to this sacred earth we call home is evidenced in our partnerships and our investment strategy and our relationship with saving the Amazon. So thank you for listening to um, information about Ads Mobile, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Eduardo Gamarra so he can share the survey results. Dr. Gamarra. Well, thank you so much, uh, Maria. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm especially grateful um, really on, on behalf of FIU uh, the Adam Smith Center and the, the Jack Gordon Institute uh, uh, for the support that we've received from Ads Mobile over the years. Uh, we're we're going on a decade worth of worth of relationship. I think it's been eight years, but uh, it's been a long time, and uh, and we hope it continues for for a while. Um, this is uh, of course the the uh, the second uh, uh, webinar that uh, I've been pleased to to direct and. Uh, which reflects the survey that that we just conducted. We were we were in the field um, from July third to July twelfth. Um, we were in the field for nine days. Uh, this uh, this is a, a mixed method, uh, hybrid methodology, if you will, uh, which used both uh, uh, phone calls and web based surveys to to produce a, a sample of uh, uh, one thousand thirty two, which is the effective sample. Um, we uh, we have a margin of error of about three uh, three point one percent. The survey was conducted in ten states with the highest proportion of of Hispanics who are registered to vote. You see the list of states there. 
Um, what you'll see in this uh, in this particular presentation is a weighted sample. So um, uh, we're we're weighting it by by uh, uh, by uh, age and. Uh, uh, so to get a, a more effectively uh, uh, random, more effective random sample. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be I'll be glad to answer them. Um, so um, uh, these are the twelve states that uh, that have the highest uh, uh, number of Hispanic voters, uh, and as you can see, some of these are very important states in the context of the of the elections, right? And, we're interested in the in the percentage of uh, uh, Hispanic eligible voters, and of course we've drawn the list to conduct this this survey from uh, from individuals who say they are registered to vote, right? Who have act from voter registration lists as well. All right. Um, so uh, one of the kind of test things that we do at the very beginning, we've asked this question now for a while to see if, if there's any variation. But it has to do with self-identification, right? And uh, we, we're fascinated by by this question because so many people uh, still identify primarily as Hispanic, secondarily as Latino, and only very distantly as as others. Um, as you see, one of the, the the things that we have is this this uh, classification of of Latinx, which appears in in a lot of uh, bureaucratic documents, yet. Uh, most Hispanics in the United States prefer still to be called Hispanics. Um, now, let me try to go through this uh, rather quickly so uh, so I do save some time for uh, for uh, questions. Um, the general sense is that the country is headed in the wrong direction. Nearly 60% of those we interviewed say that the country is headed in the wrong direction. And of course, this is really quite interesting uh, in the sense that it really uh, goes in the opposite direction of what uh, 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 at least uh, I understand from the figures coming uh, out of the out of the, uh, uh, the 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 Biden administration and uh, figures which are absolutely verifiable, uh, right? Things like we have a uh, a very good economy, we have low inflation now, we have low unemployment. Um, and so on and so forth. And yet most Hispanics are still seeing the country headed in the wrong direction. Um, and, and perhaps trying to understand this is the fact that they, they also see inflation, jobs uh, uh, as the two principal reasons why, uh, why things are, you know, this is to them is the, is the central issue. Uh, you see that immigration is up there in, in number three, and then the others which are kind of uh, uh, for, further down. Right, and uh, and it, and it's very very interesting to see uh, in this particular survey how foreign policy is not really top of mind for mo for most Hispanics, at least those who answered this survey. Okay. Uh, now this is again a repetitive question, one a question that we can we've continued to ask when we say, you know, what is the principal national security threat? And uh, this is the second survey now where border security and and illegal immigration. Uh, are seen as uh, as the principal uh, national security threats, and of course, this you'll see this as we go through the through the through the data here. How how this is a recurrent theme among among the Hispanics that we that we interviewed, um, and then you can see, of course, the other the other uh, issues as well. But uh, uh, but it is uh, it is quite uh, quite interesting to see how how significant the border has become. Uh, as a as a national security issue to to Hispanics. Okay, now of course we 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 wanted to see how important immigration was to them. This is an entirely separate question, and fifty six percent say that it's important. Yet when they when you ask them about, as you see here, right, what is the most important issue? It's it's third, but yet they they think that immigration is a very very important issue. Okay, now. Okay, so let me move on very quickly here. Of course, one of the things that we've been studying very carefully is uh, um, this idea that that uh, uh, that Hispanic Democrats are disappearing, right? That Hispanic Democrats are are no longer that Hispanics are no longer uh, Democrats, and we continue to find that that Hispanics are still predominantly demo uh, Democrats, right? And that uh, that in in perhaps the interesting thing is the emergence of an independent Hispanic, 
And that that uh, perhaps is one of the more interesting things to study. So um, Republican Democrats are still not uh, showing a sign of growth, at least in this in this question where we ask them, you know, what what party with which party do you do you most identify? Okay, and uh, or what do you think of, of yourself as? And uh, and here you see in in the cross tabs, I've got some, I've got we've got cross tabs for all of them. So if you're interested in the cross tabs, we'll, we'll be we'll be glad to send you those that don't appear here. Um, so uh, whether it's by age, right, the the the, the figure essentially remains the same, and uh, whether it's by by education as well. And one of the interesting things is you know by state, right? Now again, I want to I want to note to you that. We have, you know, uh, again, we're we're looking at ten states, so the samples per state will be much smaller, and therefore not not, uh, uh, you know, your your margin of error grows enormously for each of the state samples. So um, I wouldn't, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, stake my 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 reputation on on the results per state. Except to say that in California we have a fair, a very, very good sample, and in Florida as well. So those trends are are pretty pretty interesting. Now it's interesting to look at voter registration figures as well, which kind of dovetail with what we're seeing here in Florida, for example. Only in two counties are uh, Hispanic Republicans more than Hispanic uh, Hispanic uh, Republicans more than Hispanic Democrats, and that is Miami Dade County and Lee County, which is a smaller smaller county. Okay, so uh, now. Again, to sort of uh, make the case that that Democrats are still fundamentally, uh, uh, pardon me, that Hispanics are fundamentally uh, Democrats, you can see in this question, which again we've asked several times, which party best represents your values? And again, it's over fifty percent. It's dropped a little bit, right? But but again, uh, not that much. What has what is interesting is that now over thirty percent say that the Republicans uh, uh, best represent uh, Hispanic values. OK, so uh, now along those same lines, and again, because our, our uh, what we're the one of the projects that we have here and uh, students are working on doctoral dissertations and so on and trying to understand whether, in fact, there has been a move away from uh, from the from the Republican Party among Hispanics. And so we asked the question in the past year, have you switched political parties? Right. And. Uh, um, uh, the, the way we asked the question last time was, have you thought about switching parties? We, we, we switched the question to make it mo much more, more accurate in terms of saying, all right, have you switched parties? And 14.5% told us that they, that they have indeed switched parties uh, in the past year. And so, um, and again, we, we have the cross tabs and you know, uh, more, more females and males say that, that they've switched parties, right? Um, and uh, and here by by age by age right it's uh, it's also interesting because younger people seem to be more prone to switch than 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 older people and that that's that's quite quite an, an interesting observation okay now uh, and by and by state again we have some very interesting numbers here uh, for example if you look at Illinois again w warning you of the smaller sample sizes in these states right now okay so. Then we wanted to know, okay, so if you've if you've switched, how have you switched? And again, as we found in the past, uh, the the largest move of that fourteen and a half percent is from Democrat to Republican, right? And then the second is from Democrat to Independent, right? Uh, and approximately nineteen percent of that fourteen and a half percent say they've gone from from Republican to Democrat. So, so uh, this tells us a little bit more about about where uh, those who are in fact switching, how they're they're switching. Okay, uh, let me let me go a very very quickly here. Uh, uh, we we decided also to find out okay what you know what best describes why you have switched, and I frankly have found some really interesting uh, answers to that question and. Uh, the, the number one reason is I lost confidence in the leadership of my former party. And you'll see why this is important as we go through the rest of the study, right? It's it's not so much about, uh, you know, the other party being so much more appealing in terms of its platform and so on. It's the loss of confidence in the leadership of the former party, okay? 
that to me says uh, tells a very significant tale. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, keep that in the back for for a moment, and let's go to to talk about uh, uh, about general perception of uh, of you know uh, of this administration, and in particular of President Biden. And and here we see you know something interesting that uh, you know forty two percent say that they have a more negative view today than they did four years ago of of uh, of the president, and this of course bears bears out in terms of approval as well, right? The total approval in this sample of President Biden is forty point two percent, and when you when you look at uh, um, at uh, uh, at the opinion of, uh, of of Joe Biden in terms of favorability, it's also interesting that you know that uh, he retains a little bit below fifty percent favorability. So they may not approve of him, but they still think he's a nice guy. In other words, right? They have a a, a rather favorable opinion of uh, of the president. And having said that, right? The the interesting thing is we we also wanted to kind of contrast this with the other leaders, and so. We asked, especially in the context of developments, uh, recent developments, we've asked, uh, uh, what is your opinion of Vice President Harris? And you can see here that uh, among our respondents, uh, more uh, have a favorable opinion of, 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 uh, of the Vice President than, than of President Biden. Um, and this this may may uh, as as we as we go along we'll we'll see why this may be an an, an important uh, an important part of our discussion. Okay, so um, now uh, so we also asked okay what is your opinion of of Donald Trump, and and here you see that uh, uh, that uh, President Trump has a has a only forty three percent again a little bit higher perhaps than uh, about even with 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 President uh, Biden. But his unfavorability is very high, fifty-seven percent, right? And that that tells you a little bit about Hispanics. They 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 may be uh, um, you know questioning uh, Biden and so on, but they still don't like, uh, at least overwhelmingly, like uh, like Donald Trump, right? Now, uh, having said that, right, we we uh, we tried to go down into some statements that uh, that have been out there. So we we asked the question: Do you agree? With a statement that Donald Trump's uh, uh, indictments are politically motivated, and uh, and look at this, right? Forty four percent agree with that statement, and and this, of course, by the way, if you do it with a national with a national sample, right, it's fairly much the same that people, you know, uh, are 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 um, believe that those that those uh, uh, that the indictments are politically motivated, and. And then, and then, so we took other statements that are that are out there that are that are in fact part of the of the campaign, especially here in Florida, right? Which is this idea that if Biden is reelected, the U.S. will become a, a communist country, right? And there's you know twenty eight percent of Hispanics agree with this statement, right? Almost thirty percent. That's uh, and that of course coincides with support for the Republican Party, right? But what I found interesting is that, you know, 21.7%, 22% neither agree nor disagree, right? And that's a group that I would, I think is still very susceptible to this idea, right? That, uh, that the, the, the Democrats are socialists and therefore if they, they're reelected, they will uh, uh, install a, a, a communist uh, dictatorship. But by the same token, we asked the question on the other side, right? Which is, uh, part of the, particularly in 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 some of the social media uh, uh, coverage, this idea that if Trump wins, we will have a fascist dictatorship in November, and uh, and here among Hispanics, almost fifty percent agree with this statement. Okay, and so so uh, again, it's a, it's a it's a rather interesting uh, um, contrast, right? That uh, thirty percent believe that if Biden wins, we'll be communists. And almost fifty percent believe that if Trump wins, will be will be uh, will be fascists. So um, um, uh, I'll leave that I'll leave that there. Okay. Now, we 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 dug into the the whole question about immigration to try to see again measuring some of the statements that are that are out there and that are that have been so so much in the, in the, um, in the, in in the in the public discourse, right? And 
And of course, so we took this statement that, you know, the most effective way to combat illegal immigration is to is to do a large scale roundup of undocumented immigrants and, and implement mass deportation. And again, if you look at this, 32 percent of the people we polled agree with the statement, either agree or strongly agree. Right. This is why, again, that's sort of the core of the Republican Hispanic Republican support for President Trump. And in some measure, this is why President Trump can come to to Miami, either in Hialeah or in Doral, our two great neighborhoods, right? And 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 essentially announce those kinds of plans. There is support among Hispanics with uh, with these with this kind of policy, right? Similarly, we we wanted to get a sense about DACA, right? And uh, so uh, we took some of the messaging and and uh, and put it and converted it into this statement, right? Uh, that DACA right, uh, should be eliminated because it grants citizenship, it doesn't, right, to undocumented immigrants, thereby taking away opportunities from American citizens. Again, very, very similar results. 32% agree with that statement. But there is 25% approximately, well, 24.3, who are, who are neither in agreement or disagreement, right? And that, to me, if you, if, you, if you combine those two, then you're way over 50%. 50% people who who uh, who who might not be entirely committed to the idea that DACA is a good idea. Okay. Now, um, and and so then you know uh, if you've if you've been uh, uh, watching the Republican um, convention, of course, this has been been uh, uh, very interesting uh, in in terms of the speeches that are that are there. But the, the one was you know the new waves of of undocumented immigrants. Uh, are primarily criminals who threaten American public safety and harm our country. Uh, therefore, constructing a wall is urgent, right? 34% agree with this. And again, a quarter are undecided, okay? So again, there is a, a core here that agrees with, with this view, right? They, they agree with deportation. They're not in favor of DACA. And they, they uh, believe that uh, immigrants are primarily, right, a, um, a, a, um, a security threat. So, um, okay, so, so we, we, we asked uh, here, um, uh, for who will you vote in the November elections, right? Now, we've gone through all that, and we generally ask this question at the end, right, and uh, at the beginning and at the, at the end, actually. But uh, so we, we, uh, we, uh, we've uh, found that uh, um, forty-one percent of this sample says that they would vote for for Joe Biden, right? Despite everything, they would vote for Joe Biden. But that number is significantly below what we found in December of last year, where we had fifty-four percent telling us that they would vote for Joe Biden, right? And and Donald Trump has essentially remained the same. Again, if you look at this figure, it's essentially the same figure that 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 supports the statements that we just went through. Right, the the key difference might be, you know, the growth of the of the don't knows, and then the presence of of uh, although they're not really that significant of uh, of third party candidates, right? But the the don't know group is is really the one that for us uh, has been uh, has shown up this time in a in a much more uh, uh, much more prevalent fashion. Okay, so uh, again here we have the we have the cross tabs and um, now. So, uh, so, so that I can I can end and, and, and give you a, a good a good uh, amount of time to to discuss this. So, so part of the the conversation today and and everywhere we we did we conducted this survey right after the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the debate, which was on June twenty seventh. We went into the field on July third, right? So um, that it was a, an intense week in which this this question about uh, President Biden's uh, permanence, right, uh, um, uh, was, uh, was, under, was under intense discussion. And so, you know, we asked, uh, should Joe Biden be replaced as, as candidate? And, and you can see here, overwhelmingly, right, that, uh, that uh, in this sample, 60% uh, believes that Joe Biden ought to be replaced as candidate, right? Um, and remember, we 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 also asked if if these were the candidates, Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump, still forty one percent say they would vote for for uh, for President Biden, irrespective of how they saw him at the debate. Okay, so 
Um, uh, let me move uh, now. Uh, um, is uh, you know who should replace Biden if he if he's forced to, to resign, right? Or or if he resigns as candidate. And and here we found it interesting that that Vice President Harris uh, emerges as the uh, as the preferred candidate. And uh, you know a distant uh, second uh, with California Governor Newsom, right? So uh, a rather interesting interesting uh, uh, um, uh, number for for the vice president. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Uh, I guess that's. Let me just go back a little bit here. Um, uh, I think I missed one or two slides, Maria. But did I? I think well, yeah. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Well, we'll uh, um, so um, okay. So 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 the, we we then you know wanted to, to um, uh, well we asked you know have you watched the, the 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 convention? How many watched it? Of course, these are registered voters. Many claimed that they had watched it, and then we said, one of those of you who watched it, how many of you uh, think that uh, who who won the debate? And in a, overwhelmingly, the, the the belief was that that uh, that Donald Trump had won the debate. So it's it's a fairly uh, uh, fairly interesting uh, uh, set of options that emerges from this. Now, having said that, then you know we we wanted to to know. Okay, you you think the president the the president should step down? We think you think that you know Kamala Harris should be the the replacement. But what happens if you get to the convention, right? And uh, what should Democrats do at the convention? What are the options? And we gave them the, these two options, right? The party should just simply nominate the president, period. Uh, and then, and, or versus the idea that the party should nominate another Democrat, right? And, uh, and you can see here again, although there's only a four point difference, that this group of Hispanics we, we, we surveyed uh, believes most believe that the president ought to be replaced at the convention. Okay, so um, so there are are the results. Uh, the 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 survey is is a very large survey, and uh, we'll be glad to share with you the the full deck, and uh, and have a, have a conversation about it in in greater detail. So so that's uh, that's it. Let me see if there are any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gomara. This is super interesting. And yes, the survey and the recorded webinar will be shared um, no later than tomorrow. Um, we don't have um, any questions just yet. I, I do have a question because I think this is so interesting in terms of losing confidence in leadership. When you think about the the why behind the lost confidence, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, Maria, you know, in in just in terms of the of the of the numbers that we have here, right? It it, it seems to me that uh, especially among among uh, 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 and and if you go back a couple a couple of surveys, uh, Joe Biden has never really been able to connect with with Hispanics uh, the way in which other other presidents did. So, so if you go back to to Bill Clinton with Hispanics, or if you look at, uh, I'm talking about Democratic presidents, mm -hmm. and certainly Obama, right? That that very deep connection that he made with Hispanics, um, that was not transferred uh, to to Joe Biden, and from the very beginning, there's been a sense that that you know that the president hasn't fully connected with with Hispanics and. And fairly or unfairly, right? Because I think the, the president has done a fairly good job of, uh, of uh, uh, for example, hiring great Hispanic staff. There are some wonderful people that work very closely with him at the White House who are, who are Hispanics and so on. Uh, and uh, and of course, other things like uh, like you know the uh, the fact that uh, you know um, more Hispanics are employed today than ever, right? Those those kinds of figures. Yeah, right? yeah. Some of the some of the numbers. I mean, the, the the disconnect, Maria, that exists that is really so difficult to explain, because if you look at what the administration tells you on the economy, and you look at what the what. Uh, uh, we have a question, by the way, which we'll, we'll be able to to to, to share with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the members of this webinar. Um, 
perception about the state of the economy, right? And and it's really interesting because uh, um, you saw the idea that inflation is the biggest problem, yet in fact inflation is low, right? But it's, yes. It's, and 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 it's headed in that direction. Um, if you look at the figures of economic growth and so on, the U.S. really right now comparatively has one of the best economies in the world. But in surveys, survey after survey, what you find is the perception that we have the worst economy in the world. And Hispanics are, you know, among the first to say that. So that disconnect to us is really is really interesting. You know, Maria, I've only found that disconnect when we are when we when we do uh, similar uh, public opinion studies about insecurity, mm -hmm. uh, public safety in Latin America, in some of the safest countries, right? Mm -hmm. The perception of insecurity is very, very high, right? Uh, so, so here we have, have right one of the best economies in the world, and yet most people believe that we're we're living in I don't know where. So. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. The the percent that um, we're interested in nominating another Democrat and Kamala Harris as the preferred, um, the the preferred you know substitute, if you will. I, I what are your thoughts on that, and how much closer are we to that after this uh, post assassination attempt on President Trump? Yeah, I think I should have made that that clear at the beginning, Maria. That you know, uh, um, if we had been in the field a little bit more, right, a little bit yeah. longer, maybe maybe the situation with these numbers would be dramatically different. We don't know, right? Uh, we're going to be conducting another survey uh, in September, so right. uh, we'll have the numbers by October, but. You know, it just so coincided that we were going to go out into the field and, uh, you know, we didn't say right after the debate, but it was right after the debate, but pre-assassination attempt. So we we don't know. Now, uh, now just putting on my, my, my uh, you know, my, my CNN hat, I guess, right? Yes, yes. Um, uh, you know, um, I think it's, it's anybody's guess right now what, uh, what, uh, um, you know, the, the most of the polling I saw is that, you know, Kamala sort of has figures, similar figures, right, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, she's, she clearly leads the field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but in the end, uh, it's, it's entirely up to the president to decide the direction that, that, uh, that, he, will, that he, he will take. And, and that's going to, you know, how Hispanics are going to see that, I think, is going to be interesting, right? So uh, I don't know, frankly, that the vice president has done uh, uh, any better at linking up with Hispanics. Okay, so I think her her public opinion record with Hispanics is probably equal to, even though she has a little bit more favorability, it's not that much better. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's about supporting the party, um, and still committed, which we've seen over previous research studies as well, that they are more favorable to a lot of the pillars of the Democratic Party, right? So it's more about continuing to support the party, but the candidate is the issue or leadership at the top, which is very interesting to me. Exactly, that's the the main takeaway, I, I think from this, from this particular uh, iteration, is that you know Hispanics are still Democrats. They still yeah. think that the party best represents them. But they are frustrated with the leadership, right? And mm -hmm. and so they may, you know, uh, they're not telling us they're going to vote massively for for Donald Trump, right? But we are seeing a significant number of Hispanics moving, and again, that's where by, by state you have to look at it and see that, you know, there's clearly in some states, Florida and Texas in particular, where that that migration has taken place. Yeah, which which. I also think is interesting because to to leave one party for another party is significant to make that decision. Um, I've done it in my own life and it's a difficult decision to make. And I'm amazed at the percentage that made that decision over the leadership because leadership can be changed, but the pillars or the ethos of the party remain the same for the most part. Right. Although again, in, in a lot of studies of, of party ID, right, uh, you know, um, Party ID is supposed to last generations, right? Right. And right. Uh, um, 
but we're seeing now, and you saw it in the figures here in the crosstabs, that you know, younger people are the ones who are telling us that they have that they're the ones who've moved. Not a significant proportion, but more younger people under 34 have made that switch than older people, right? And that, that, I mean, it sort of falls right into what the literature tells you about the st stability of party ID, but it's younger people who are apparently more susceptible to the messaging. And, and what we're seeing anecdotally, and we're seeing it in, in other studies and focus groups and the like among, among young people, how uh, uh, they have been uh, very susceptible to, to, uh, uh, to the conservative messaging, right? Right. Uh, and I think we've only, you know, I, I make sort of the parallels with the, with the Reagan period, right, where, where Ronald Reagan was able to generate, right, a, a whole uh, uh, cohort of young, you know, young yuppies, remember yuppies, right? Who yes. Young, upwardly mobile. And today, I think we have that phenomenon. But there's also another way of looking at this, um, Maria, that, that I think is interesting. Ronald Reagan won in large measure because of what were, were called at the time Reagan Democrats, okay? And, yeah. uh, they were, you know, they were moderate to conservative Democrats who didn't want to, you know, vote for for uh, for their candidate. And I think, you know, part of it was Jimmy Carter, right? And uh, uh, today, uh, I think we're, we're you know, uh, in fact, uh, uh, several authors are already saying that, right? That Hispanics today are the equivalent of Reagan Democrats, right? That mm. they are the ones who are going to, in essence, be, you know, largely responsible for the outcome in, in November. Okay? Interesting. Okay, we have a couple of questions that um, it'd be great if we um, got addressed. One is uh, the reasons most respondents support the Democratic Party. Uh huh. That's the question. What are the reasons most respondents support the Democratic Party? Um, okay. Oops. Hold on a second. Why do Democrats? Why do Hispanics support the Democratic Party? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, I think it has to do with with this question, with this um, uh, with a question of which party best represents your values. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's that very, you know, we've had this, this is a question we've asked for many years and, uh, and you see, you know, that it's, it's fairly overwhelming, right? Um, it's been much higher. It's been above 60% in the past, right? So uh, it's dropping, right? And it's growing, but then again, you know, uh, among, among, uh, among uh, that 30% that solidly identifies with the Republican party, clearly the Republican party has their, but, but I think a majority of, of uh, and, and, and this is in our surveys, it's in, it's in other, other, other surveys. Uh, you can look at Pew, you can look at Gallup and so on, and you'll find the same consistent answer. You know, this belief by a majority of Democrats that their values are better represented by, by, by Democrats. And, and of course, this is a very big debate because uh, uh, a lot of what we're, what what uh, goes today into into the political discussion has to do with issues like abortion, right? That this idea that that Hispanics are 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 conservative right. on abortion and therefore you know those values, but we, we don't find that, right? We don't find that. And we have a, a battery of questions on abortion. I didn't want to put them in in here, um, uh, but uh, but we have them. We have them as part of as part of this study. Um, similarly. Um, I think if you if you look at uh, at questions like gun control, right, um, uh, support for gun control, you know, is uh, um, is fairly widespread among 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 Democrats. Okay, um, uh, but uh, but there's also a a good thirty percent who is completely against, you know, who largely uh, covers themselves in the in the in the discussions about the about the about the Second Amendment, right. So, mm -hmm. so I think when you when you look at the whole range of values, and 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 again, we also asked, uh, uh, which we didn't graph, and we don't have them here because I, I thought I was going to end a lot later, but uh, um, uh, we asked questions about, you know, where do you situate yourself? Are you on, are you on the are you a liberal or a conservative, right? And what it, again, we find consistently is that most of us 
we have this perception that we're smack in the middle, right? We're neither way to the right or to or to the left. We're smack in the middle. And we've repeated the question about, you know, what is your opinion of, 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 so, of socialism? And what is your opinion of capitalism? And the curious thing again is that we find, you know, that 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 uh, the majority of the opinion is is right down the middle, right? There right. are there are these extremes where people think that communism is really bad and 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 uh, and uh, and capitalism is really bad. So so, but there's this consistence, right, in right smack in the middle and this alignment with the Democratic Party. Great. Okay, thank you for that. We have another question from Maria Villarroel from the Latin Times. Why do you think the Biden-Harris ticket has struggled to connect with the Latino electorate? And can this trend be changed or improved before November? <laughs> well, uh, very, very, very difficult question to answer. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, as, I, as I noted, right, um, over the course of this administration, this administration made a very big effort uh, at, at naming uh, Hispanics uh, to prominent positions, right? Everybody from my former colleague uh, as uh, ambassador to the OAS to, uh, uh, to very, you know, interesting, uh, um, uh, also, uh, you know, journalists and so on into high positions in the White House, right? And uh, uh, the, you know, the, this emphasis in trying to, trying to make uh, communications bilingual and so on, right? So, so they, they, they have made a, an important effort. But, uh, uh, but again, I think maybe, you know, that uh, the messenger is, uh, has, been, has not been very strong, right? Uh, President Biden has not held very many press conferences in general, much mm -hmm. fewer, of course, to, you know, with, uh, with Hispanics. He's had, you know, uh, days like the Venezuelan day at the White House and things like that, which, have, which are interesting and, you know, they, they, they make, but they're not very effective overall in moving the electorate, right? There's this, there's this view that the, you know, distance between the White House and the, and the Latino electorate, right? Um, and it also has to do with uh, with age old kinds of uh, kinds of uh, concerns, right? Um, um, they the 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 Democratic Party is uh, is not well organized in uh, in some states, including Florida. Uh, they start their campaigns late. Um, the uh, candidate selection is not that that uh, that uh, that efficient, right? Um, and, and uh, and one of the the, the more uh, difficult things is that uh, there's still the perception that uh, Democrats take uh, Hispanics for granted, mm -hmm. and, or because they take Hispanics for granted, why should we spend any amount of time trying to trying to connect with them since they're ours? We should be working, you know, uh, other sectors which are which are more important, more 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 critical to 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 winning back the White House. Right, right. Yes, absolutely true. We have a question from Mireya Navarro uh, regarding the Republican Party, the reasons most respondents support the Republican Party. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that is a uh, is, uh, is a question that I that I that I see here in Florida uh, every every day. Right. Um, and uh, uh, so we we oversampled in Florida, and and we can see that very very clearly, right? Um, I think it has to do with uh, with uh, uh, one. See everything I said about what Democrats, in theory, do not do, Republicans do well with Hispanics, right? They certainly don't take Hispanics for granted. They make enormous efforts to 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 reach out to them, whether you know whether you like the the like that or not, right? Uh, and especially in, in 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 a state like like Florida, but I'm sure that the pattern is repeated elsewhere, right? Where where you you have an enormous amount of effort at trying to uh, to to uh, let, let me let me just give you the story of Senator Scott, for example, right? Uh, he has spent the last decade trying to learn Spanish, and he has he he messages in Spanish, and he and and you know. Um, uh, 
just being a little, you know, a little funny here, you know, his, he, he hasn't learned much Spanish in, in 11 <laughs> years, right? But he's, but he's out there, right? And, uh, and he's made that, that, that effort. And, and, and he's, he's almost, you know, it's, it's really in, in some measure, almost to the point of pandering, right? But, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's this effort that they, that they've made in trying to connect with Hispanics. And then, of course, there are other issues which are really very interesting to 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 observe. Like, uh, um, you know, even though most Hispanics across the country tell us that foreign policy is not, you know, not a top of mind thing, but foreign policy is important, right? and especially here in 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 this state where where uh, Republicans have done a phenomenal job of pigeonholing Democrats into this idea that they support, you know, uh, the uh, the the Cuban government, the Venezuelan government, the Nicaraguan government, and the like, right? And and so the messaging has been very strong, but but it's not messaging alone. I think it's the strength of their campaign, well funded campaigns that are that are permanent, right? They don't rest. They they have a twenty four seven campaign cycles, right? And I think that 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 pattern probably repeats itself nationally. And that's playing very well. We've we've done uh, here at the Latino uh, Public Opinion Forum. We've done surveys of of Venezuelans, of Cubans, of of, of Colombians, and so on, trying to segment these groups. Uh, and uh, we find that 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 has been very effective in moving those populations toward toward the Republican Party, right? And and it's something, of course, that I think uh, uh, yes, the the Democrats are are. Uh, uh, are trying to emulate, but they're they're emulating late, late in the game, right? And so now, uh, you know, there there are some places where where basically the, the campaign is all but all but over, right? But uh, but I think uh, um, you know the, the 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 Democrats are I think have listened to to some of the criticisms that they've had over the years about how they don't they take the community for granted they don't. Uh, they don't uh, listen to the to the messaging and so on. You know um, things things that we've we've uh, we found here in, in in Florida again. You know, for example, on the progressive me messaging, right, right. If you come down here and you say you're a progressive, right, that doesn't go over very well, right? Because um, uh, and Republicans in particular have really been able to 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 grab grab onto that and say, see, you know, you see this video image of Fidel saying he was a progressive or Hugo Chavez saying he was a progressive and so on. Mm -hmm. So they've learned both the, the, the campaign, the, the campaigns are very effective. They have candidates, you know, who, who they, they painstakingly uh, select. Right. And, uh, and I think uh, they don't, they they certainly don't take the, this population for granted. Great. Yeah, agreed. We have another question, which I think you've answered some of it with what you just shared. Um, the questions, do you feel that the Republican Party is doing a good job with the Hispanic community at a national level or just in Florida? And do you think it's a matter of trying to connect with them in language? Yeah. Um, look, I, I think that's a that's a very good question because it really touches on some of the things that, that adds mobile is, is interested in. It, mm -hmm. it has to do with acculturation, right? right. Um, look, I, I think uh, that uh, um, uh, Republicans have done a very good job nationally. It's not just Florida. I think it's nationally, right? Uh, and so those three things I said about what Democrats don't do, which Republicans do well in Florida, I've seen them do it well elsewhere as well, okay? And you can see it in, in places like, like uh, Texas. You can see it in Nevada. You can see it in, in other in other parts as well with with large Hispanic uh, communities, right? So so uh, uh, so the messaging, the campaigns, and and candidacies work, right? Uh, now, having said that, right, uh, is it a good thing to message in Spanish? Yes, of course, right. Uh, Senator Scott demonstrates that, right? Even though. You know, for example, most of you who have who are Hispanic and may have children, your kids probably communicate better in in, in English amongst each other than you do, right? And uh, the, and you know, you might even talk to them in Spanish and they'll answer in English. 
Well, I think that that's in part what's what we see now in uh, uh, if you do the cross tabs on age, we have a whole uh, we've asked the same questions about, you know, what what uh, how do they communicate and so on. Uh, uh, and what language? Again, we asked that we asked that question. I just haven't graphed them. But uh, but what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, English is uh, um, is preferred. Right. It's not that they reject Spanish, but when you do the the cross tabs, you you see how age largely differs, right? And then it also differs in terms of you know um, you know for example how the messaging has an impact on people depending on the language you 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 transmit, right? So for example, disinformation messaging, this this is a sort of a plug for for the DDIA, uh, the uh, Democracy Institute. Um, the Digital Democracy Institute, which just released its survey on, on disinformation, uh, and uh, I'm I'm on the on on the board, and I've been privileged to see their results, and and you can see that right that people are more uh, people who seem to be more susceptible to disinformation appear to be those who only get their information in Spanish. All right, and and there's a cross tab there too with age, right? So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'll just add a caveat here based on our experience here at Ads Mobile, um, that that it, it really does depend a lot on generation and acculturation level, like you mentioned, Eduardo. The bilingual, bicultural, uh, once you receive messaging bilingually, I mean, English, of course, lead with English, but provide Spanish cues or winks. You know, one of the misnomers that we hear all the time, brands will be speaking to us and they'll say, well, you're um, Hispanic, but you speak English perfectly and you were born here. So our general market advertising is reaching you. And that's the, the, the biggest misnomer because yes, it's reaching me, but it's not touching me. Touch is a totally different animal. Touch is qualitative, not quantitative. So what is the, what is, what are, what are the cultural insights and nuances you're using to reach me? Maybe primarily in English, but with Hispanic with, with Spanish cues, if you will, or winks, as we call them. So yes, it depends on what generation, what level of acculturation, and right. what you're trying to say, a general market message um, that's based on a self-reliant ethos from the get-go is not going to get you there. Right. Thank you. Any other questions here? We're almost at the end. Um, I, I'm just going to ask because it's always something that surprises me, this whole concept of um, border security and illegal immigration. And I, get, I think the DACA answer, the DACA question addresses that, which is why, why most are concerned about it. Oh, we have one more question from someone else. Let me share this. Regarding perspectives on economic systems and government styles, do you see any trends along age brackets or recency of immigration, which might indicate levels of experience in different economic or political settings influencing perspective. Okay, uh, any trends along age brackets or recency of immigration? Mm -hmm. Levels of experience. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, um, we, you know, we, we have the, 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 the age brackets for this. I haven't graphed them. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of interesting. For example, when you when you see those who who are uh, um, you know in the question on socialism and and uh, and so on, right? Um, we historically saw, for example, things like uh, you know um, people who who uh, uh, who arrived in different periods. Uh, tend to be much more to uh, to the right or or to the left, depending on on what group you see. For example, with Cuban Americans, it's it's been very important to see when they arrived, uh, uh, and uh, and how they line up right with those uh, with those uh, um, uh, with those uh, uh, with those answers. Uh, here, what we what we see though is that in age, right, and and this I, I tell you as a as a university professor, right, you you would imagine that. That younger people are more prone to see, for example, socialism favorably than than capitalism, but we don't see any really really significant uh, trend there, right? Uh, across all age brackets, they're smack in the middle, right? And uh, 
Um, uh, I think, though, that the, the, the one that's more important, which we've, we've seen in the studies that my colleagues do on, on, uh, on Cubans, uh, the more important issue has to do with, uh, with time of arrival, right? Time of arrival really influences a lot of things, as Maria was saying also, in terms of acculturation. Yeah, absolutely. And one final question. What do you believe is the greatest challenge Hispanics face regarding misinformation with the upcoming elections? Oh, boy, that's, uh, you know, I, I yeah. again, I want to I want to point you in the direction of, uh, of the study that DDIA just did. Right. Uh, because it has some very, very interesting data. My my, my sense is that uh, uh, Hispanics are um, uh, facing a very serious problem with fact checking, right? Uh, which is very available largely to to the English speaking crowd, but not so much for the Spanish checking crowd. And in fact, one of the things that uh, you might you might want to check is uh, is this thing that. Uh, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of different organizations, uh, um, uh, both abroad and in the United States, are, are uh, factchequeando.com, right? Uh, thing, things like that, that they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they, they've produced a lot of, uh, a lot of these uh, organizations that are really about fact-checking, right? Hispanic organizations that are fact-checking and, and very, very important ones. Uh, but but still, you know, I think the most the, the greatest challenge, um, and and perhaps again, it's a it's a problem of 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 being in South Florida, right? That um, to me, the biggest problem is how disinformation gets mainstreamed, and uh, and and what do I mean by mainstreamed? Mm -hmm. um, it's when something is said, whether it's on a social media site or on on or reproduced by a by a by a family member or what have you, right? Um, uh, gets uh, um, reproduced by by a by a media source, right? By a, by a, by a respectable uh, uh, journalist um, in in afternoon radio, for example. But that cycle is very interesting because so, for example, if you look at uh, um, you know, just the debate that we've been we've been talking about between President Biden and uh, and former President Trump, right? The the fact that uh, that President Trump uh, was uh, was not truthful was reported by most most uh, mainstream uh, uh, news uh, sources, but uh, but when we we did the monitoring locally, right? Uh, there was no report whatsoever of uh, of the you know. Uh, uh, the questions about the veracity of, of, of President uh, uh, Trump's statements. And so um, most of what the president says is accepted at face value, right? And that then gets, because it becomes news and it gets reproduced and it gets told over and over again. And again, my, my, my biggest uh, concern is that in Spanish media, right, is where fact-checking is slowest and in where it has the least impact in terms of correcting, you know, when somebody is not telling the truth. Mm, very good point. Um, okay, well, we are one minute to the, the noon hour here in the West Coast. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Gamara, yeah. for joining us. Uh, thank you for sharing this study, which is fascinating, um, informative, and extremely educational. Um, we look forward to our October webinar with the September results. And uh, for all of those that uh, registered and attended the webinar, we will be sending everyone a link that will include both the recorded webinar and the presentation no later than tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining. Thanks again, Dr. Gamara. Thank you, my pleasure. Bye-bye everyone.